All right, thank you everyone um, for joining the Town of Windsor uh, Human Relations Commission conversation on race. This is a special edition because of Black History Month. And we're just making a little special, uh, we, uh, well actually we have two more. We have this one and the one next week on the 28th, which will deal with the uh, resolution that we passed um, for calling uh, a health disparity um, in the town of Windsor. We were the first town to do so. So um, I want to thank our panelists um, for being here. You will meet them later. And also my facilitator, Cassie Copeland. Thank you for being here. She will introduce herself shortly. Uh, my other facilitator, Genevieve Condone, um, had an emergency, so she's not going to join us this evening, but she sends her best to everyone. She moved to North Carolina, so she was going to Zoom us in from North Carolina. So thank you for Genevieve, wherever you are, um, <laughs> for joining us. Um, Cassie's going to, we're going to play a little short video, and then um, Cassie's going to take over and introduce herself and our very special panelists that join us. Um, but right after this, I'm going to say a few words about the Black family and the theme of Black History Month. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Judge Washington. So I'm about to share my screen. I'm going to ask if everyone can give me a thumbs up if they can see and hear it. So this is a short video clip to kind of get ourselves ready for some of the conversations that we'll be having today. All right. Here we go. And I have the link open here. Can everyone see this link? Thumbs up if you can see it. Awesome. I'm going to make it full screen. And here we go. Volumes up all the way. When you look at the dropout rates of young African American males out of high school, and you look at the incarceration rates of African American <clears throat> males today in this country, it's alarming. Alarming. <laughs> The black family is is not monolithic. You know, it's multicultural now. Um, you know, the African American family. Um, it, you know, it looks like, in certain ways, the Obamas. You know, uh, a biracial man, a, a African American woman, and kids that are have some measure of of, of, of mixed cultural background and mixed grandparentage and all of that. But what I but the most disturbing thing for me when it were, with regards to um, traditionally underrepresented groups, the African American family, et cetera, are the young people that I work with through my foundation, the Manchester Trusting Foundation. Three out of every four young person I work with is being raised um, by a single parent, usually a mother. We can talk about all the different socioeconomic factors, sociological factors, and all sorts of things that have, that have, that have transpired over the course of that, and whether uh, having two parents in the home is really the, the, the most important thing. I believe that you have the best results when you have two parents in the home. Certainly, economically, you do. Uh, all the research bears out that when you have two parents in the home, the family saves more, does better, et cetera. Yet, in many African American families, we don't have that. And it's something that I think that all of us have to take a look at. In my book, The Conversation, I talk about the, the black family and, and different elements and aspects of it and talk about how, um, over time, there's been this disillusion of, of, of the African American family certain ways. Some of the problems go back to uh, slavery. And when you had the purposeful uh, uh, disintegration of the family unit, where purposefully the wives and the parents were separated from themselves, the husband and wife separated, separated from the kids as well. And so the, the, so people think that there's a the sociological element there. Some other people believe that during the, the Industrial Revolution and through the, the, the in, the onset of certain types of welfare laws where it was almost encouraged in certain low-income communities for there not to be male in the home because certain amounts of monies uh, and food stamps, et cetera, were not given if there was a working male in the home. So number one, either had the male moving out of the house or it had the male not working, which are obviously two not great results for the family unit coming out of the industrial uh, revolution moving into more of an office-based economy, um, 
there's a lot of talk by scholars about the, you know, obviously it was predominantly white men making decisions about who they were hiring and not hiring that they wanted to work next to in their office. There, a, a lot of research had been done around the fact that many of the men, in this case, Caucasian men, felt much less threatened by African-American women versus African-American men. So they would hire African-American women to work under them rather than African-American men. So African-American men did not make the transition into those jobs. So my book, The Conversation, is more about highlighting a problem, giving ideas about potential solutions, and, and hopefully in whatever way the reader feels like they can actually have impact and have a better result because we have to do better. When, I, when, when you look at the dropout rates of young African-American males out of high school and you look at the incarceration rates of African-American males today in this country, it's alarming, alarming. And then, then you look at the recidivism rates, you look at the unemployment rates, you look at the lack of cross-generational wealth transfer, you look at the health issues around young African-American girls are the fastest growing population of HIV and AIDS. There is There are serious things happening, and this is just as an African-American, it's predominantly these lower income, underserved communities. So then it evolves into a conversation about class versus race, which I believe is always a, a, a loss leader. <laughs> it's a distraction because people want to talk, well, no, it's class, no, it's race, no, it's class, no, it's race. No, it's a problem that we have to solve, and we all have to figure out a way to solve problems. Hey, what's everybody? This is Will Harper. All right, and then I'm going to stop this here. All right, and I'm going to pop the link to this video here in the chat, so I, I know some um, people had some tech issues, but I'll put it in the chat. All right, Kevin, there you go. So um, I neglected to introduce my commissioners and I needed to do that and our partners in this work. And they are commissioners of the Human Relations Commission are Joyce Armstrong, Byron Bob, Max Kuziak, Patricia Mack, Kareem Muro, Desiree Primus, Leonard Swade, myself, Joshua Amaro, and Rebecca Jacobson. I serve as the chair of the town's Human Relations Commissioner. Our partners in this work are First Church of Windsor, Grace Church, Archer Memorial, Windsor Historical Society. So we thank all of our partners for working with us and we thank the, the work that the commissioners are doing as well. This year's Black History Month returns to its roots with a new focus on Black family ties. The theme for 2021 is the Black family's representation, identity, and diversity. It explores the wide ranging diversity of black family life from single to parent to two parent households to nuclear families, extended families, and more recently biracial families. Throughout black history, factors such as slavery, inequality, and poverty have put pressure on maintaining family ties. When a better life meant traveling far from home, this may certainly be the reason why family reunions have always remained popular within the African-American community. And that means annual get-togethers with far-flung family that includes a joyful exchange of memories and photos and storytelling every year. Paradoxically, economic pressures that may pull Black families apart may also unite them together. That is against prejudice and bigotry. Many black families may pull resources or find job opportunities or recommend someone or simply find emotional comfort within their own micro community. In that respect, brothers or aunties may be good friends or neighbors who simply qualify for that title. Throughout American history, the Black community has always exhibited an unwavering understanding of the value of family as an incomparable source of comfort, strength, and even survival. Cassie? Excellent. Thank you so much um, for sharing all of that, Judge Washington. So my name is um, Cassie Copeland. I am going to be one of your facilitators for tonight. So I'm going to introduce our panelists next. I know two of our panelists are currently having a tech issue. So when they come back on, I will introduce them then. 
Um, but we have Sage and Nicole. If you want to unmute yourselves and then just say your name and one fun fact about you, that'd be great. Hello. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, I'm Sage and I'm from Windsor High School. I'm a sophomore and my favorite thing to do is dancing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening, Cassie. Nice to see you via this uh, lovely method, which is really foreign to me. I like to see people face Dr. Sunday. And again, congratulations to you. Uh, Judge Washington, I've seen you actually out in the, actually in Windsor. Um, of a, you know, I think that mural thing that yeah. you guys did in the town. So I commend you guys and um, that know me and I know <laughs> it's, it's very hard for me to pause. So I want to commend you guys for bringing everybody together. Um, very intrigued to hear about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so fun fact about me, um, I think those that know me, I, I'm very, very intrigued in terms of, uh, well, it's hard. I'm pausing because I said everything that's going on today. Um, is really causing me a lot of pain when I when I pause and it's a Sunday. Um, but I'm really, really passionate about education, I'm really passionate about inclusion, I'm passionate about a lot of different things. Um, I must say, not to give my resume, um, but based on some of the things that, that we're going to touch upon, um, I think um, a lot of those things and a lot of um, the ability for people to yield and step in places that normally they wouldn't has propelled me to be the person I am today. Um, so I say that generically, um, but I say that to say thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, and I'll be patient and be quiet, which I normally don't, <laughs> but I see you guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. So these are our first two panelists. And then our second two are Mackenzie and Lisa. I know you're popped back on here. So if you'd like to just um, introduce yourself and then give one fun fact about yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. Um, I'm a senior. Um, a fun fact about myself. Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm a theater kid. There's a fun fact. I, I did drama for since I was in sixth grade, so for seven years. Wow. And hello, everyone. My name is Lisa, Mackenzie's mom. Um, Fun fact, all right, um, I was born without a sense of smell. Oh. So it's not COVID related. <laughs> it's really how I've always been. So that's an interesting fact. Awesome, oh, thank you so much. So as you'll notice here, um, we have two um, panels from each household. So a, a part of our event tonight is we're gonna be really talking about age and racial identity. So we have a variety of panelists from different ethnic and age backgrounds. So it's gonna be, um, we're gonna have some really great conversations tonight. And a part of having great conversations tonight here is having some conversation guidelines. So as you'll see here, I am presenting my screen um, just to go over a couple of quick conversation guidelines. So in order for everyone to truly be their authentic selves and flourish, we have some guidelines to follow. The first one is speak from the eye. So you want to speak from your own experience, not he said, she said, they said kind of thing, but more of how can I really come from a place of my own experiences and speak on that? Uh, we have listened to understand one another. So in, in the society of being surrounded by technology all the time, it's, it's easy to just, to just kind of get into the pattern of just looking at it and then going to something else next. But we really want to listen to one another and, and try to come from a place of compassion. All right, we're gonna lean into discomfort and feelings. This means that, you know, sometimes these conversations are tricky. You know, talking, again, speaking from myself, like I'm multiracial, so sometimes I'm, I might have discomfort uh, from an experience or something that someone said, and then I might think, oh, well, I can relate to that, or I might not be able to relate to that. So lean into that and maybe question, well, why am I feeling that way? And how can I, learn more about myself and others through these feelings. And we have confidentiality. It's a fancy word for the Vegas rule. We take the, the stories that everyone says and we keep the stories here, but the lessons that we learn leave with us. So if we learn some, of, some amazing lessons of perseverance, of triumph, of pain, of everything here, we're gonna take those lessons and bring them back into our communities, into our network spaces. 
right? And then we're gonna keep the stories, all of the names and more of the details here with us online. And finally, we have be respectful. So being respectful online looks like um, staying muted while someone is talking. Also um, using the chat sometimes. So if you want, if you'd like to have an additional comment or story or something, you can type it into the chat. Um, Judge Washington will just flag me down if there's someone has a question about anything that we're going through. Um, and these are our conversation guidelines. Is there anything else um, anyone would like to add on this before we move forward with our tonight's program? I would feel comfortable, able to flourish in our conversations. All right, great, I see a lot of head nods, awesome. All right, so here's our brief agenda. We're gonna go over the purpose of tonight because as, um, as uh, Judge Washington said before, um, it, it, it's, an, it's a unique event in, in the sense that we're gonna, we're gonna really talk about race and our experiences over time. And that's gonna look and feel so different based off of the era that each of us have grown up in. Um, then we're gonna do some background and context. So I'm gonna, um, whoop, I'm gonna go here through uh, a couple of key points around some, some of the things we're gonna talk about. So everyone has the same platform and knowledge base. We have our group dialogue. This is where you all get to get to share your thoughts and experiences. So after um, we have our panelists talk about their perspectives and get to know them a bit better, it'll be your turn. And then finally, just our, we'll have our closing final thoughts where everyone will be sharing out a couple of words here or there about how we are feeling. And then I have some optional homework because I am a second grade distance learning teacher. So I always have homework at the end of my presentation. <laughs> awesome. All right, so this is our, our brief agenda here. And then the purpose of today. So we are gathered here today to really understand how the intersection of our age and racial identities impact how we experience culture, food, and religion. Now we have these three things, culture, food, and religion, because well, where do we usually connect with people? Well, we connect based off of the culture we're in, the food that we maybe share with each other. And maybe even some of the religious institutions or lack thereof. Maybe sometimes I, I have a great conversation about, about different religions because I watched Game of Thrones and that was fire, right? So, so, so these things really shape our understanding and sense of age and racial identities. Now, this isn't to say, this isn't to exclude gender, class, sexual orientation, but like we could keep going. But we are going to focus on age and racial identities today. Um, to get an, an understanding of these three concepts. All right, so what, is, what does intergenerational mean? Because when, when we asked our panelists here to come today, we specifically asked to get people from different generations. So when you look here on the screen, you're gonna see um, there's, there's two different ways that we kind of categorize um, people based off of age. And a lot of this has to do with the year you were born in. So we have from 1900 to 1924, which is the GI generation, uh, 1925 to 1945, the silent generation. This is where most of my grandparents fall into that one. And we have the baby boomers from 1946 to 1964. Then we have the 13ers or Generation X, 1965 to 1979. Then we have millennials, my generation, um, 1980 to 2000, or also known as Generation Y. And then finally, the new ones um, coming on up here are from 2000 up to present day. We have the what's called the new silent generation or Generation Z. And we're going to kind of unpack what all these labels here mean, because I know that uh, not everyone will categorize themselves this way. But when we talk about intergenerational, I, I'm talking about maybe I'm sitting at the dinner table as a millennial. I grew up with cell phones. I grew up with like watching certain genres of TV, whereas my grandparents here who are from the silent generation, color TV was brand new. There, there wasn't all, they, they didn't have cell phones. So they grew up in a different environment and space and that impacted their sense of self. And when you also look at some of these years here, you're going to notice that there were different things going on in the world at that time. During some of these generations, there were entire wars that aren't happening right now. Right when we look at World War I and how that impacted the GI generation, World War II, how did that impact baby boomers or the Cold War or the Vietnam War? 
right? So there's a lot of different factors that are going on, but we like to have a place where we can all kind of come together and understand when we bring more than one generation together, that's what we call intergenerational. So the second image here on the right-hand side kind of highlights some of the global events that have happened that have really shaped some of the individuals in each of these generations. So when you kind of look at some of these, and again, everyone identifies their kind of age generation differently, you're gonna kind of see what was going on in the world and how that might impact that someone's sense of self. So I, again, speaking from the I, I'm a millennial. So I would kind of go over here because uh, I was born in the 90s and you can see some of the things that were going on. Again, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's quite a bit more that was happening during each of these times. This is to get a general sense of what was going on and how these things have shaped us and, and as we are going into who we are today. So we can see under the millennial one, it's 9-11 attack, the community service immediacy, the um, confident, the, the diversity, social, everything, Google, Facebook. This is where like social media really started to take off when the internet became a thing. So like, <laughs> or more of a thing, right? All right. So this is kind of um, our, our group understanding of what is intergenerational mean. Now, why is this important with food, culture, and religion? Because if I was a mixed person here growing up in the 60s, and I, I'm, I don't know where I might have been accepted for based off of my background in culture, religion, and food. So really, we, were, we, we chose food, culture, and religion because that really shaped all of our identities here. The role of food in the family dynamic is crucial. I know that over food, we can build better conversations. We can build better relationships and context with each other. Who we consider to be family in the first place, do they have to be related by blood, right? And then understand that there's intersections, meaning that there's commonalities and you can have moments of connection with religion and food. Whether I know maybe as a, as a Christian, I might see, oh, well, anytime I have bread and wine, I'm going to think of communion. Or maybe from my friend who we, we spend a lot of time together and, and she's Muslim. So she has different customs entirely. And there are over 250 plus different kinds of religions that all have their own food and culture that really shape our, ourselves and our identities. And finally, culture. Why culture? Because that really forms the essence of who we are by our experiences over time. Culture for me as a millennial might look as, oh, well, I, I go on Facebook every day to check up on my friends. Then I go to Instagram. Then I go to TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, right? But does my mom do that? Sorry, mom, I know you're here. Uh, no, she might not do that, right? So we are all really experiencing these things differently on, on, on different levels here. And this really impacts our sense of self racially, because maybe when I'm, the, and, and again, speaking from the eye, from my perspective, when I'm with my white side of the family, we talk and act and, and, and commune over food differently than my black family, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today are some of those similarities, those differences, and why it's so important to, to understand one another based off of these, right? So I'm going to stop my screen share here because we're going to get into some panelist questions. But before we do, does anyone have any questions about age or race kind of moving forward before we get into our panelist perspectives? No? All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. Feel free. You can use the chat as well because now we're going to head into our, our time and space where I won't be talking as much. It'll be all about our panelist perspectives. All right. So to start us off here, we're really talking about a lot of a lot about age and race. So I'm going to start over here with um, Mackenzie and Lisa first. So our first question here is, um, as a person from either like millennial generation or whatever generation you are from, how has religion impacted your sense of self? Can I start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, I'm from Gen Z. Um, and honestly, I haven't had a big impact, um, with religion. Um, I have my Mimi and my Papa, um, they're my dad's parents. They are very religious. Um, and I've seen how 
they, um, the importance of religion on their side. So for example, um, personally, I haven't been in a church in almost a, like a year and a half now, just, um, but for their 60th anniversary, which was um, two Decembers ago, it was very big that um, all of their kids and grandkids came to the church to celebrate um, their 60th anniversary. So I've noticed that my grandparents, who I don't remember what generation they are, they're before the baby boomers, but um, religion is very important to them. However, for me, I don't, um, my family doesn't really practice a religion and um, yeah, that's, that's really it. Yeah, I would just add on, um, I was raised in a religion as well, um, but I'm not a part of it anymore. And I would say that what, what I miss from that is that sense of community, mm -hmm. that knowing kind of people from your community in different ways. And that's a really big hole that um, I experience now as an adult. Um, and I think there's a lot of power in that. And there's a lot of connection and just being connected to a community where you can be um, a support or you can in some way um, know what's going on and help out. It, it's a great way to kind of stay in touch with folks. And so we, we're missing that, we don't have that piece. So we have to seek that out in other ways. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing Mackenzie and Lisa. Uh, and Lisa. I know that sometimes it's really challenging when we, when we really think about well, what does this mean to me and how has that shaped like who I surround myself with and, and how and how I behave towards them. So I, I definitely appreciate um, your perspectives. So now I'm going to turn the same question over to Sage and Nicole. So as a person from like millennial, baby boomer, whatever generation you're from, how has religion impacted your sense of self? Okay, so I'm same as Mackenzie. I'm from Generation Z. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Gen Z. Um, and I would say, like, I really never practice religion like that as well. Um, I do find myself, like, tr trying to have that kind of connection with God. And, like, I have a belief in some, like, certain things. So, but I don't really practice it. So, I would say there's kind of this, um, like, I wouldn't say... Yeah, I would say it kind of impacted me a little bit not having that connection in the church because I personally would like it, but um, I would say I don't have that kind of community, which I would appreciate. But yeah, I think that's it. What about you? <laughs> well, I guess I, I should answer. <laughs> um, that's a layered question. Question, and I'm sorry I want to spend so much time on thinking through this question. So, um, I believe that that's in terms of how old I am. But as you were raising the flag of your millennial, Cassie, I'm going to say I'm a Generation X uh, person, and I'm really like woohoo for so many things. But um, born and raised Baptist, so um, religion was very, very important in my family. I can remember. Um, so many different, different traditions, but um, I would say as a young um, girl, I was always, um, I always had independent thought, if that makes sense. I always knew that not necessarily what was presented to me was always the truth. Um, and I also, when I, you know, through schooling, through my community, born and raised in Cambridge, I had the opportunity to kind of broaden my thought process. So I started realizing it's not the truth. That's very, very important to me. Um, I, don't, I tend not to, hence my my daughter speaking to what she's speaking to, I kind of like um, for people to delve into different endeavors to help shape who they are, right? So even though I was born and raised as being Baptist, um, like I said, it, since I came to Connecticut, I'm not born here, um, we were brought up in a church, and once I was not connected to that, I really didn't feel some of the things I was learning along the way. Um, that I could find that connect, I'm sorry, a connection um, because I had a lot of family members that were deacons and, you know, um, of the church. So I think that severed my tie to the formal, um, I guess, the formal basis of what church means. However, um, I do have a relationship with God. 
Um, and I don't really feel that necessarily have to be in a church because of that that I won't get into um, in terms of defining what my beliefs are. Um, so the fact that I know there's a higher power, um, I tend to meditate, tend to converse with um, God um, to guide me through this physical world that we live in. But um, I would say it's just not necessarily religion that shapes who I am. Um, and I'll kind of keep that as a dot, 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 dot. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. I know a part of your transmission is a little glitchy. I'm not sure if it's from internet or connectivity, but just to let you know, it's a little, little tricky to hear you there. But I, th those are some great points. Absolutely. Because um, I heard both both of um, Sage Nicole and Mac and Lisa, you were both talking about this sense of community and how religion is maybe a place where we can have that sense of community. But I'm, I'm wondering here, well, what does community mean to you? Is it is it only is my sense of community only based off of identities that I have, whether I'm, I'm based off my race or my age or my religious background? What does community mean to you? Um, so either one of you can go first. Whoever would like to take the question. Right. So the question was, what is community mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, um, let me see. I feel like there's a variety of answers to that, but I feel as though it's having um, feeling at home, I would say, um, knowing someone or whoever I say that's my community. Um, we like know each other, know each other as um, like the back of my hand. Um, and there's like this growing that we um, can do together. So I feel like connection, having that connection in a community is very important in knowing, it's knowing each other <laughs> um, helps us with that growth. So that's what I would say. <laughs> Just to add to that, which seems probably and usually probably in for me, I'm a very abstract uh, communicator um, and a very highly intuitive thinker. But when you said community, the, 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 the first thing that came to my mind is actually a word and it's knowledge, right? So I think a community as far as being able to tap into knowledge, but not necessarily saying that I'm um, part of something, right? I think it's a, it's a period of time to propel me to, I think, a higher sense of knowledge. I know that sounds really weird. Um, so I think a community helps get you to another level in your life um, by sharing knowledge. Not to say that they kind of think like community have my back because I tried and you stay there. It's more like they're the, the wind beneath your wings where they push you through along with con um, a continuum. And I know that's kind of really weird, but that's what I'm thinking about um, as far as how I view community, actually. <laughs> if you can hear me, Cassie. Yeah, yep. yeah, it's a, it's still a little glitchy, but we we were catching some parts there about community. Thank you so much for for sharing. Yeah, it's always interesting seeing the intersections of ourselves with community. All right, so now um I'm gonna send it over to Mackenzie and Lisa here. If you'd like to share, well, what does community mean to you here? Um, I would say community is in um going back to religion, I notice this a lot in churches, it's the sense of being able to form connections with people and support, knowing that the people around you, you can lean back on. And if you need something, they're going to be there for you. And um, I have noticed that not only in my grandparents' church, is church, but um, um, I've attended a church in Bloomfield. Um, we were supporting a a friend who was in a play and there was enormous support there and enormous community and it was beautiful and um yeah so I would say it's kind of the sense of forming a bond over either a shared interest or just love and support yeah and just to add on to that um because I agree with everything about the connection the sharing the support I think there has to be an element of trust you know, that, that your community is one in which you can feel that sense of openness. You can, you know, you can lean in and ask if you need something and, and you're hoping in the same way that, that people will ask of you to be supportive in that way. And so it has to have trust. And I think that comes from not only being around together, but also communicating. 
So I think the dialogue and the conversation and kind of um, what Nicole was talking about, you know, the, the depth of the knowledge and the depth of the openness um, really help bridge and build that community in a much more cohesive way. And, um, and there's times when you, you, you know, you have a sense of community, but maybe it's, it's more of a, of just kind of a, a casual sense, but then there's other community that kind of comes in and, and it's more of a tighter circle. And sometimes you don't even have to say what you need. They already can tell because they know you so well. And I feel that that's really beautiful too. And I love to have all those different rings of circles um, that I can kind of navigate through. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, so it seems like community is is larger based off of some of these experiences and connections that we are having with one another. So kind of when we're thinking about that, um, have you been able to build uh, your build out your community a bit more because of your age or racial identity? So I'm gonna say that again. Have you, have you been able to build out your community more based off your age or racial identity? So kind of to provide an example, I think of myself as a millennial because born in the nineties. And I think sometimes when I talk with millennials, we just kind of just get each other better sometimes where, we're, where we just like text a little fast or, or we'll communicate super quick and be like, oh, well, we're gonna do a five minute meeting here just to go over X, Y, Z, A, B, C, done, right? And I've been able to get a better sense of my community uh, based off of people my age, right? So that's just kind of how an example of like my age identity and how I've been able to connect with more from that. But what about you all? Have you been able to build out your community based off your age, race, or even both? I'm sorry, can I chime in, Cassie? So I love that. <laughs> That's how I began this conversation. Um, I seek, um, besides my college mates, and I can definitely tell you, um, I, I love Generation X people. And I'm going to tell you why, not that I negate anybody else, but I can tell when I'm speaking to it, I feel a sense of like um, community, right? Because there's a lot of things where we know long division, we have to tap into some sort of technology, we break it down, we have time to speak together. And I think those connections, not negating other gen generations, because I have an appreciate, appreciation of um, carrying their past. And I think I love it because I'm learning a lot um, from connecting with them. Um, and I lost my train of thought, but the fact of the matter is, um, yeah, I kind of like to get into the, the sandbox with my Generation X people. I feel very whole. I feel like I can talk the way I'm speaking and they just get, get you really, really quick. And I can actually bring this to another set. One more thing is I'm astrology, like fellow Tauruses. They just seem for me, I think they just are on a different frequency. For some random reason, I just, I just come for level for me. So. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah. So, so I know that sometimes you just find those people that's like, yes, we just click. I, I feel you on the astrology part there. Yep. So Lisa or Mac, would either of you like to share as well? Sure. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so um, again, I'm from Generation Z and um, we grown up with social media. Um, and like, I think I first got Snapchat when I was like 13 and, and now I'm 18. And um, I've noticed, especially with um, TikTok, which is a newer social media platform, is there is a large sense of community, especially among um, Generation Z, um, in the sense that I see people forming connections over topics that, again, going back to community that they share an interest in, and they create bonds over the internet. And you know, you might have a friend who lives across the country or who you've never met in real life, but you form that connection over um, your shared interest. And I think that social media is a great way to connect with people. And I've noticed that um, my generation has done that a lot because it's a newer thing. Um, and I definitely think that it's, um, going back to what Nicole said, it definitely has to do with your generation and what you have been through. And because my generation's grown up with social media and what things we've experienced and how that shapes us. Like I haven't, I wasn't alive during 9-11. So the conversations with that may be different because my generation mainly wasn't there, but it has to do with what you grew up with. And yeah. Mm. Yeah. And um, I'm also generation X. Um, 
but I do have a son who's, uh, who's Y and then I have Mackenzie and two others in the house that are Z. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're many different generations. And I noticed that, um, a lot of times I'm the learner. I'm the one who's being taught, um, a lot about the newer ways to build community and to engage socially by my kids. And a lot of times I have to kind of check my, my way of thinking about things because my thinking might be a little bit more dated and everything's changing so fast. And so I have to be open to that and even be open to how um, the communication is, like what a certain emoji means. <laughs> Don't wanna make that mistake. And some of the other, um, just even the, the three letter acronyms and things like that. I'm, so I'm learning to build community by using current language um, from the younger generations. And so being open to that is, I've, I've noticed that I've had to be really aware of that. And I think across all the different experiences in my life, um, you know, you have a job or you move and you might lose touch with people. And so nowadays there's the great ability to stay in touch with people. Um, it's no longer writing letters and putting stamps like we used to do. Uh, so I find that if you put in the effort, you can build your community across timelines and across, you know, state lines, whatever it may be, um, as long as you put that effort in and really value it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, Mac and Lisa. So before we move on to kind of into language and the family dynamic, kind of uh, thinking about our age and racial identities, I'm going to pause real quick. And if anyone from the audience here would like to share their thoughts or questions, or if you have anything, you can um, raise your hand by just using your hand to raise it, <laughs> or you can click on your name and raise your digital hand, or you can um, type your thoughts and questions in the chat. So at this time, I'm going to take two um, volunteers as tributes. My millennials know about me. Okay. <laughs> Before we call on you. Yes, yes, or else I'm going to just start picking people. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Deborah. Oh, were you raising your hand? I wasn't sure there. Oh, no, sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. Any other risk taking? Listen to right now. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Anyone else like to share any? Thoughts, comments, or feelings at this time? Anyone? I'm going to start picking on people. <laughs> We're going to call you out like a classroom, Miss <laughs> Jane Garaby. Representative Garaby, I'm choosing you. So what are you asking me, Judge Washington? The question is about generational differences. What have you seen that's different? What have you experienced in yourself that is different from when you were growing up as a, as a young person to what is going on now? So I, you know, we have lived with many generations in our household at one time. I have three children, one's X, one's Y, and one Z. Um, I feel that my time growing up was simpler. I had a stay at home mom, you know, um, roles were very defined between parents, whether good or bad. It just seemed like life was simpler. And I see, um, especially today's youth, um, in my view, they have it much more difficult than I did, you'll hear from my generation, we were sent out to play on the street, um, you know, come back when the lights go on, you right. see that commercial from rice a you know, dinner's ready. Um, I know, now I'm really dating myself. <laughs> so in my view, um, but things have also gotten better, I think, because we lived in our little bubbles the things that are going on now were going on then, but we didn't see it. Children today or young people are um, learning much quicker and younger about the world and what's going on. So, Excellent. Excellent. Cassie, thank you, Representative. Cassie, I'm going to let you choose the next person. Awesome. Oh, I, I, have, I have my eye on someone, but I'll wait. 
<laughs> All right. Thanks, Judge. Uh, so I see Lisa, you have your hand up if you'd like to go ahead next. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for sharing. So honestly, um, really appreciated your thoughts. I was just going to say, as uh, being a lifelong educator, I think I have had an opportunity to catch up with uh, each generation because I had to. And I think that, um, you know, brought up as a baby boomer, there was a lot of things that you could rest on. But when you're working with young people all the time, it's so invigorating. Um, and, it, and it forces you to sort of keep up with the communication and the trends. And I think that's really what's wonderful. I agree with Representative Garibay that, um, you know, we're no longer sequestered, sequestered in our little world. We, we actually are more connected because of technology and new things. And, and when you're an educator and you work with generation upon generation, you get to see the best um, in, in the way things are changing. So I'm a real uh, believer in staying up with the trends. And you asked about you know building community. And I think for me, when I was listening to the speakers, I also don't practice um, a religion, but I do have a deep sense of community uh, based on sharing causes with other people. You know, I, I gather around with people who who find uh, things that are important to them like education or the environment or animal welfare, whatever it is that we believe strongly in and trying to make the world a better place. And I feel a huge sense of community uh, with people of all ages. That's another exciting thing about it because there's people of all ages that are interested in those kinds of things. So that's, I guess, the way I feel connected um, because I no longer do practice religion, even though it's brought up quite, quite uh, devoutly. So um, there's other ways to stay connected for me that I find just as, I appreciate just as much. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks so much for sharing. Oh, this is such, it's so great to build this um, sense of community and understanding one another better from our own perspectives here. I know Judge, you have your eye on someone else you wanna call on? <laughs> yeah. I am calling on my brother, Dr. Terrell Hill. I would have bet money on that. Judge, you have like no <laughs> poker face. I was like, you gonna call me or Jane right at the beginning of this. I knew it, it. Was, it was either you or, or Dr. or Sunday. Oh, right, well, he's gonna be next because I'm gonna do tag you in. So <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> so uh, it, it's good to join you all. I'm not gonna get controversial. So. <laughs> This is this is my world. This is what I've been doing professionally, actually, besides education for you know over 25 years. This is the work that I do. So the one thing I can say is that we have, I, I agree with um, Representative Garibay, we have definitely uh, progressed and, and made a lot of gains, but I think there is still much work to be done. And when you talked about, I was listening to a piece about the uh, generational um, you know, crossing over with generations. I've seen as an educator, and I think Ms. Brett said that, right? We adapt as, as educators, we get a new batch of students. And I really think like pretty much every three years, it's like a whole new culture. So you just wow. you keep learning. Um, but if you're not in that role or you're not actively trying to adapt, then, you know, just quite frankly, you can become stuck in, in your own time warp. And the world has moved incredibly. Um, at, at hyper speed. And, you know, if you want to operate in this world and not be seen as a dinosaur, then you're going to have to really reflect and make those changes. And I still see that gap in, in our society and in our community. You know, we have, we have to like look at things as they are and know they weren't, this, they're not the same as when we're young. Jane, I'm not calling out numbers, but yeah, getting home by the streetlights, nobody had to watch. That's just how we got home. Nobody was late. Your mom's voice was a cell phone for the entire neighborhood. <laughs> they cared about 10 square blocks. You know, you stop playing ball. I got to go home. So, um, <laughs> but things are different. And I, I'm just proud. I said this morning in church. So yes, I, I attend church regu regularly. Um, I teach in church. I actually shared the word this morning. So I minister in church as well. Um, and my message this morning was position for a purpose. So uh, I think the church is quite relevant even still. Um, I would like to see more young people. I think that, you know, we spent a lot of years pushing them away in various ways. 
And so, you know, I've actively been working for years to bring them back and see that, that there is a spiritual balance that you need to bring to your everyday life and it should connect and it should be relevant. So I'll let Dr. Asunday carry on from here. Tag your it, Uwe. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, thumbs up. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Dr. Hill, well said. And um, I definitely want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues. We're actually in a very privileged position to work as educators. And um, for those of you who are on the call who may not know, I am uh, the principal at Windsor High School. So when I, when I speak about the privilege I have, um, every year we get a chance to see um, our community's kids come through our building and grow right in front of our eyes. But one of the other exciting parts of the work that we do, um, every fall, I get contacted by an alumni class and they want to come back and do a tour of uh, the high school, the hallways that they used to walk through. And if you really want to hear generational stories, uh, you know, really spend some time with um, those different alumni classes. And the good thing, Cassie, to expand on your point about community and everything that Sage and Nicole and Lisa McKenzie said, to expand on that point, the good thing about community are the bonds that exist, that provide a sense of psychological safety, a sense of physical safety, and a sense of support. So <clears throat> for me, I was born um, at the turn of, in the early, early 80s. I'm not, you know, <laughs> dating myself now. I feel like I've lived many, many years. Um, but I turned, you know, I was born in a time where technology started to boom. And to uh, Ms. Garibus' point, that really made life speed up a little bit. And I'm not trying to say anything about Ms. Garibay by Rice and Roni. I don't even know if they make that anymore. Back in my day, it was, it was uh, Uncle Ben's, <laughs> Uncle Ben's Rice. But, um, you know, we're very, the world is, you know, in 2021, the world is in a very unique place. And I'm saying this in that there's a lot of, challenges that the world's facing right now that positions us to rather than have small communities positions us to with the opportunities to see if we can fuse the work of all those small communities to do something greater for everybody you know there's a saying that says that if you know better you should do better and i believe as we have these conversations about intergenerational groups I believe we're positioned to do better. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. I know that it's so powerful to be able to have these connections over time. I know recently I got to talk with my grandfather and he's from, um, he's from like, I think like the thirties or so, like the late thirties. And he's like, oh yeah, I got to watch everything going on. So anytime we have these conversations and meaningful connections and relationships to be able to truly impact who we are in that moment. It just, it, it can lead us to new paths and, and new, new understandings of ourselves and those around us. And that kind of leads us into our next question about how everyone's been talking here about communication. So how has communication really impacted our family dynamic? And when I think of family dynamic, I also sometimes think of the family who I might not have blood relationships with. I might think about the family that I created because I went, I graduated from Windsor High, class of 2013, whoop. So I think about how some of my friends, I see some of those friends who I grew up with here in the town of Windsor for so long that I see them as family. So how has that communication element impacted how I see f the family dynamic? All right, and I'm gonna turn it over to um, Sage and Nicole or Mac and Lisa, whichever one of you wants to go first. Any risk takers? I'll just uh, pop it over. It looks like uh, Mackenzie and Lisa, would you like to go first? <laughs> I'll go. Um, so I actually don't go to Windsor High. Um, I went to Windsor Public Schools up until fifth grade, and then I switched to Metropolitan Learning Center. It's a correct school in Bloomfield. Um, and I've had a community in the sense of my school takes um, in students in the Hartford County. So I have students who 
live in Vernon and students who live, or peers who live in um, Enfield and Hartford and West Hartford and everywhere. And so I have a large range of community. Um, it can be difficult to hang out with people because they can be like 30 minutes away. But um, I feel like I've been able to see parts of different communities based on where people live. And um, I do still have friends who live in Windsor because I, I grew up here and I still have that sense of community, but I feel like I have an additional community because I've gone to such a diverse school. And one of the things um, that's really important to me is that um, our children have a lot of experiences in life and they have a lot of diversity in their life, diversity across many different factors. Um, and so that's been really important to us. And I didn't have that growing up. I grew up in a very small, um, kind of probably lower middle class um, area, kind of on the border of Vermont. And so there wasn't a lot of diversity and it was really more kind of structured based on um, probably class and earning levels in that respect. And it wasn't until I got a chance to get out and go into the world and go to school and meet lots of new people and, and do some travel around the country for different opportunities that my, my eyes opened up and I learned a lot and I paid attention a lot and I asked a lot of questions and I met a lot of fantastic people who were willing to help me learn and kind of school me around things that I had no idea no idea whatsoever. And I'm very hopeful right now because one of the silver linings, I think, of kind of being contained in our homes and, and being extra safe is um, we, we're having different conversations. So when you asked about the dynamic of conversation, um, there was um, a book I read a long time ago by Susan Scott, and it was called, it's called Fierce Conversations. And what I love from that book was she said that the conversation is the relationship. So our relationships are really based on the conversation that we're having and how real is it? How deep is it? How open is it? Um, are you listening? Are you doing all the talking? Like all those factors. And I have found during this time being sheltered with our family that I've learned a lot from them. I've learned a lot about their perspective on what's going on in our country, what's going on in their community, their schools, what's happening for other people that they know, that they care about and love. And just really understanding that um, our children know a lot of things. And if we just kind of stop and zip and listen, and then when we open our mouth, open it with a question, there's so much that I'm learning about this from the perspective of different friends that Mackenzie has. And, and so it's, it's been incredibly valuable and I'm so grateful that I paid attention. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. I know that it's really interesting thinking about how the pandemic kind of fits into all of this, you know, how we're having this event online instead of in person and how like how we're communicating differently. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to now turn the same question over to Sage and Nicole. So how has communication impacted your family dynamic, whether you define family as people you live with or who, who have blood relations or, or however else you define that? Wait, could you just say that last part again? Because we just... Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I got you. Yeah, so, so the question is, how has communication impacted your family dynamic? So for me, um, I have like a lot of families. Like I have a family within my school. I have a family within when I go to camp um, in the summer, but you know, it's COVID. But um, I would say, um, especially my generation, we're like social media, it kind of disrupts like that actual community that we're trying to form. Um, Cause like, even like sitting across the table from my friend, we're gonna be like, oh, on our phones, TikTok. Oh, look at this. Like, we're not talking, you know? So it's kind of sad that way. But I feel as though, like I mentioned, Agassiz Village, that's, um, that impacted my family dy dynamic, like very, like, it was like a really great opportunity I had because I learned how to communicate with people. We didn't have our um, phones when we went there. It's like, we're living with these, I mean, we're, yeah, we're living with these people that we have never met, making these connections, learning new ways to live. Like, um, 
in a cabin, you know? So I learned how to actually um, form a connection with someone that you, I have I don't know their background. I don't know anything about them. And we just make that strong connection and bond. Um, and like going into like my family at my like school, um, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, you don't really know um, people's background unless it's like you make that connection um, with them. And like how um, I think, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, but she mentioned, let me just find her name, I'm sorry. Um, you said something about um, you make that relationship like through, I'm sorry, I'm finding her. Oh, I think it, Lisa, yes. That's what you, yes. Okay. Sorry. I was trying to, okay. Um, you mentioned that you make that connection when, um, when you have that, you make that relationship when you have that conversation. And like, um, like I said, me speaking with my guidance counselor, like we just make those bonds and like, we understand each other and I feel safe. I feel support. So I would say that's how, yeah, impacted my family dynamic. Go ahead. Can you flip that back? Because oh. I don't understand. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> Can you say the question again? Do you mind, yeah. Cassie? Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so the question here that we're, we're answering is, how has communication impacted your family dynamic? Oh, so family, again, just kind of capitalizing on what everybody says. Family, to me, is a very... Um, interesting de definition. So I, I, I kind of focus on that being a little bit more vast in terms of the traditional sense of being family, like my immediate family, my family that I was brought up in and everybody else, right? So um, focusing on communication now, because I think this is absolutely crazy how we're living today. And sometimes I feel like crying and going to a, a quiet space in my closet. Um, but one thing I think my daughter was kind of echoing on um, is really big in terms of communication. I pride myself and I'm a little bit frustrated within myself um, that I love to be able to connect and communicate with a variety of different people. Um, that was really big being born and raised in uh, Cambridge, Mass. Um, and my school was right side of Harvard and just really delving and in, interacting with different people is very, very important. So one thing, if I have the opportunity to pause, I would probably be proficient in multiple languages um, because again, I like to have those connections with people. Um, and really, besides the phone, because I'm a traditional person on the phone, this is really cool, but I like to be face to face with people so I can tend to learn and connect with them on a deeper level. So I would say um, overall, I'm still in contact um, with my college mates, um, my grad colleague, colleagues. Um, I went to BAPS and so we actually have a lot of international students that have had that exposure. Sage is kind of echoing um, camp, which is really great, or counselors, they're, they're, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, variety of different cultures. So that exposure is very important. And then here's the thing, wow, we're kind of in this lovely space that is completely lovely insane. Um, you can pick up a phone or kind of do the Zoom thing and connect with people and continue to grow within yourself. So um, impact knowledge comes back to my mind. I'm continuing to grow because I can communicate with different people and grow and learn different things. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing. These are some great responses. Now, I kind of want to follow up. Um, Sage, you said learning to new, learning new ways to live right now during this time of the COVID, uh, during this time of racial uprisings, during this time of like insanity, basically, right? So our next question is really going to kind of hone in on that. So our next question here is, um, if race has made a difference in your generational experience, how, how has how does race really come into the mix of all of this? I know, again, to provide an example, when I think about myself um, as a mixed person, half white, half black, I think about how, about people's perceptions. They look at me and they're like, oh, well, you, you must go to the high school there. I'm like, well, I did. So I think about that age component and then they're like, oh, well, well, what was that like after you immigrated here to the country? So then I'm like, wait, not only did you say I still go to high school, now you're saying I'm from another country here? Like, okay. And that's really impacted how I saw myself for the longest time. I had to unpack like, well, what does that even mean? Like, what does that mean to me? And then what am I gonna bring, be bringing back into my house and my family here, right? So kind of flipping this back to you all, Sage, Nicole, um, Mac and Lisa here, um, how has race made a difference in your generational experiences? 
so I'll definitely love to start this off. I would say, um, going back to what you said, perceptions, um, people have made on me. So just how I look, I'm a tall black girl, um, I'm 15, I'm, I'm a sophomore, right? No one really sees me as the smart one or they see me as loud. I'm, I'm like a basketball player or like, there's just all these stereotypes. I'm just like, oh, no, that's not me, you know? So um, I would say it kind of like, I wouldn't say it impact me like badly. It kind of makes me know that there's growth. Like I'm going to prove them wrong in that sense. Like that's how I think. So if you're saying, oh, um, you're very tall. Do you play basketball? No, I play volleyball and I'm, I'm a cheerleader too. So I just keep proving them wrong. So yeah, that's, that's <laughs> Uh, again, that's a loaded question to me, um, but if I can kind of unpack it myself. So um, I, I find it, again, as an opportunity to share. And when I say that, um, kind of what my daughter's saying, you can look at me, right? Um, and I like, to, I like for people to really be able to kind of say or communicate to I don't know, the masses or myself, what do I represent, right? And that's very, 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 very hard. I, I love to have things that are black and white, that's simple, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm a little bit more complex. From a racial standpoint, I realized, and I was shocked because I want to say it's X, and if it's X, I can go forward, right? This is really um, that make up who I am. So I'll just leave it there not to get, in, to get into that. Um, yeah, and from, and here's the other thing, I mean, not to give you my dissertation and or my educational background or anything like that, but I could, right? I'm not like you, Dr. Sunday, but I'm soon going to get my PhD eventually, but I'm a big, <laughs> big advocate for education. But the thing is, I like to um, be quiet, be a little bit um, in an enigma, and a little be a little bit odd for the sheer fact to give everybody the opportunity to have a seat at the table. However, I'm a person of like, when I raise my hand, when I speak, I come with a lot of I would say je ne sais quoi, right? <laughs> Meaning that come with a lot of stuff to back up when I say something, not for my own gain, but the fact that everybody has a voice um, and sometimes very hard to speak, I would say, um, but everybody has something to share um, without people kind of meeting someone and having a, a quick uh, step judgment, which I think is really boring and, and rude and just besides myself. Um, so hopefully that made sense. But again, I, I am, I'm an enigma. I wish I was black or white, but I'm not. Um, but it gives the opportunity to learn and grow and share. So, yes. And I just wanted to echo one thing my mom said. Um, our voices seem to get very small, especially in this time, but very small. And um, it's like very hard to speak up. Like for me, I have been in so many situations. It's like, oh, oh, did I say the right thing? Oh, like my mind's all over the place. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that because that's something big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, because there's a lot of different intersections that we're trying to understand internally, meaning like what I'm telling myself inside, but then also like what am I experiencing in real life and how like the two are interacting and, and how I see myself versus how other people see me. So I definitely feel on that. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to turn the same question over here to Mac and Lisa here. So um, how has, um, if or how has race um, made a difference in your generational experience? Um, so I'm gonna kind of talk about it in my school's perspective. So um, my school is 75% people of color. Um, in specific to my grade, I have the smallest grade. Um, there are 66 students in my grade and there are only seven um, other white students. And um, my school is a six through 12 school. And we never had conversations on race um, until about ninth grade. We had, um, there's an organization called NCCJ and they came in and they did a program called Bridges. And we got to have those conversations and we had a safe place to have those conversations. And then we got to learn about where we came from and where our peers came from. And we really got that conversation started. And then um, I did another program um, that NCCJ, NCCJ held, which was Anytown. And it was a camp I went to 
and there were a hundred um, delegates, that's what they call us. So there were a hundred different students and we were from different schools. I had like 10 kids from my school and there were kids from Windsor, West Hartford, everywhere. And we had those conversations and we talked about everything from race to gender, to sexual orientation, to age, to size. We talked about everything. And that's where I honestly felt a community because when, like um, my mom said, the idea of your relationship is the conversation. And we finally had a safe place to have those conversations because before at my school, we didn't have conversations about race. Um, and I felt that maybe school didn't have the safest place to have those conversations, but um, I was grateful that this organization came in where we could have those conversations. Yeah, and just to add on to that, so what I learned from that experience, both of from what I witnessed Mackenzie kind of taking from it, which she came back a different person. She talked different, she projected different, she, there was just something so different, but you couldn't quite put your finger on it. And what I, what I learned later it was, was that she had the support and the guidance and the space to talk about identity. And, you know, kind of talking about my, my generation growing up and my personal community growing up, we didn't talk about race, you know, and there wasn't a lot of representation other than people that look like me. And so it wasn't until I got out of that town and got out of into the world that I started to learn things, but I didn't know how to talk about it. No one ever taught me how to talk about race. It seemed quite inappropriate to talk about race. And so all this stuff was kind of being processed behind, you know, behind my eyes, but inside I didn't know what to do, what's to say, what can I say, what can I ask, what would be appropriate. And so what I learned is that, um, these conversations are life-saving conversations. They're affirming conversations. Um, and I got to go to uh, the, the um, culture night that they had when the students would get up and talk about their different identities and the intersection and all of that. And it was so powerful. It was so moving. And I was, again, once again, massively educated about different people's life experiences and the way that they are perceived and the way that they are treated. And what it gave me was um, a better understanding of how to be brave to have these conversations because you can become very uncomfortable quickly and that's okay, keep going, keep swimming. And then also to learn that because I look this way, I have a lot of advantage and that's also called privilege. And what can I do with that? How can I leverage that to be more aligned with a purpose that helps and not just to be the nice person, but also to be someone who's, who's disrupting and dismantling and also helping people to see that their identity is something that is, is truly valued. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing um, Mac and Lisa and thank you as well, Sage and Nicole. So it sounds like we were, we we're talking more about opportunities of how we can journey through ourselves and our racial identity and that it, that layer of age on top of it. So before we move to our final two questions, I'm going to open it up to everybody here. All right. So if anyone else would like to kind of share their experiences or thoughts on this topic, um, feel free to raise your hand and um, judge or I will call on you. Any risk takers today or I'll popcorn it around? <laughs> Cassie, I, I uh, just talked to you on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I just, I kind of maybe want to hear from you. Sage kind of um, spoke to it a little bit. Um, this notion or this idea, particularly as a, as a biracial um, individual, right? Maybe you can speak a little bit or facilitate conversation within this group um, around the topic of, you know, the need to code switch sometimes, mm. right? Um, maybe you can you can facilitate conversation. I want to hear from some people on that topic. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up because I think code switching seems so natural to me now <laughs> that sometimes I forget. Like, all right, not everyone does that, right? So, as a multiracial person, and I'm going to throw this back to anyone else who'd like to talk to the, about on this um, topic. So, code switching is something that I do 
um, when I'm in a specific space or culture. So maybe when I'm with my millennials here, I might just, we, we might use a lot more slang as in using different vernacular around um, having like abbreviations. We, we might say, oh, IDK or LOL. We might, we might talk different to each other, right? But then maybe, and that's just my millennial generation, how we talk. But then maybe if I'm in a predominantly black space or black indigenous people of color space, I might I might talk differently than I would in a predominantly white space. So maybe when I'm going to work and I'm rolling up, I, I might have to have this certain level of professionalism, right? Wearing my nice tops, making sure I, I look and act a certain way that is deemed appropriate. Right. But then when I'm with when I'm with my friends, it's just like, Woo, I don't have to do any of that. There's no there's no like limits or expectations. We can just kind of we can just be our best selves. But also we, we talk in a different way. There's different language that we are using and different kind of um, different gesticulations, fancy word for how we talk with our hands or our bodies. Right. So that's that's just a, one of the many ways that we can code switch, not just with our racial identity, but also with the age identity. So we each encompass many different identities here and we all might code switch in different ways. So the way I code switch as a multiracial young person from the millennial generation will be different from how Sage code code switches because because she has her own identities. I, I can't speak about her experiences. But I can't speak about Max's experiences because she has an entire different set there too, right? But if anyone else would like to share, feel free to go ahead. <laughs> Can I add quickly? Go for oh, it. Can you guys hear me? Technology mm -hmm. as it is. Um, I love that. And thanks so much, Dr. Sunday, for you know bringing up that subject because that's a lengthy, lengthy, heavy, heavy subject. Um, but yeah, code switching is definitely, um, I guess is a necessary evil, right? And you don't find yourself wanting to do certain things and you find out because someone says, oh, like my colleagues sometimes, I guess, um, kind of point out. And so, you know, I was born and raised in the suburbs and, you know, the white picket fence and life is great. And they're like, oh my God, dude, this is great. This is how I usually speak, right? And um, when I went to the camp that I brought Sage to, you know, we're, we're happy, we're happy, we have money, right? But um, intentionally, this is a camp that has um, a lot of kids that are not fortunate, um, intentionally. Um, part of, is it DCF system, everything. But the reason why I wanted myself and my daughter to go to get a different perspective but however, when you're assimilating in those situations, you're like, oh my God, my thing, you know, whatever. Um, you know, versus someone that doesn't have anything, you can get shunned, you can get totally, sorry guys, but totally dissed and totally um, ruled out really quickly if you don't know how to speak the right language. And I know my slang is a little bit off today, but um, you, you get ruled out. So you find yourself in terms of connecting with people, trying to find the language that they identify with. Um, to, you know, be able to build a connection or sometimes in many cases not get beat up because they realize you're not a part of the tribe. So um, a necessary evil, I think, is only part of besides race and just um, social economic status, status and everything else between. So just want to share that. Yes, and I agree. I feel as though um, sometimes it's necessary or it's like, okay, but sometimes it can become harmful. And because um, I actually learned about this topic last year in my African American lit class, and it's just um, uh, specifically like African American um, people doing it um, because they don't feel safe or they have to, even if they just like that's the way they speak, it's like, oh, this judgment's on them. And it's just mm -hmm. kind of, I don't know, I, I don't personally like it, but. It's just like, come as who you are. You are who you are. If you want to speak, like, oh, if you're like, French or, you know, it's, you speak out if you're French. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. And then I see a couple hands are going up. So I'm just going to try to circle my way around. I see uh, Jane Garby. If you want to go first, then um, Dr. Hill. Okay. Um, so our experience is a little bit different. Um, my children are biracial. Their father's Mexican with some Spanish, but they don't appear 
they look white. So for us, it's been a, a challenge and a fight for them to be able to maintain their identity, their heritage. Um, we've tried as hard sending them summers to Mexico. Um, their grandmother lives in Spain. And so it's just been a different. And one of my son's names is Jose. And when someone calls him at work for help, um, he'll go to visit them. It's in IT. And they'll say, oh, you're Jose. You don't look like a Jose. And they kind of discount that part of my kid. And so just a little bit different, but to keep to fight and to be proud of who you are um, and to do. That's all. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. I feel that too, personally, just as a mixed person, because I grew up, I mean, here in Windsor, but even here in Windsor, I grew up at the high school where I'd hang out with some of my black friends and then like some, some more of their friends would roll up in and be like, oh, well, well, you're not really black, but you know, you could be a fake black person. Or, and then I'd be like, oh, okay. And I'd be, I literally go sit next to some of my other friends and they'd be predominantly white or from other cultures. And they'd be like, oh, but you know, with your hair and, and sometimes the way you talk, like you're really black. And so it's like, how do you find that fine line of who am I? Who am I in this space? How can I exist, right? So it's, it's that fine balance. And there's always these nuances that Sage was bringing up being like, there's this performative element of like, well, I wanna fit in, but then what does fitting in really mean in the first place, right? So I just wanna highlight those points to yes and. It's not a yes or a no. There's always an and attached to it. I'm not black or white. I am both, right? Or maybe finding those intersections of ourselves. So just yes. Uh, Dr. Hill, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Man, I wish this was a seminar class, but I know this is a, a community thing that Judge put on. Judge, we might have to do something really deep later. Uh, I first want to say Sage and, and Nicole. So I didn't realize at first I'm looking like, oh, those are my neighbors up the street. So, um, and I'm, I'm probably gonna make Sage and Nicole both laugh. So I grew up in the inner city, straight inner city kid, nothing like Windsor. When I first came to Windsor in 2002 as a vice principal, I was like, yo, this is one of high schools from like the TV shows and the movies, right? You got the labs that actually work with the, you know, the burners. We never had that in high school. Um, you know, kids park their bike with a little thin chain and they actually ride their bike to school. Everything about Windsor was like not what I grew up with. So my daughters, two of my, old, my two older daughters have graduated from Windsor High. Um, the oldest came for ninth grade, so she's still pretty much a city girl. But then the, my middle child started here in fourth grade and then my, my last one is a ninth grader at the high school. And so, you know, we just clown her, my wife and I, my wife grew up in Hartford. We just clown her all the time when she talks, I'm just like, Wow, yeah, when we go hang around with the cousins, you might have to change that a little bit. Just, <laughs> but, you know, because she, you know, Dee is going to talk. I, I wish I would have invited her up here to my office, but I know she's, I hear her talking to her mom. But it is different, right? And so as, as, a, as a very educated person, you know, I've been code switching for all my life. And I need people to understand historically that it was for survival. It wasn't just to be cool. It wasn't to fit in. It was for survival. Slaves had to talk one way to other slaves. And when Massa came around or any white folks of power came around, they had to be very docile, you know, um, you know, constantly, you know, deferring. And so it's, that's evolved through time. And, you know, uh, again, I'm saying Sage, because I've just been listening. Sage, you hit me really hard with some of the stuff you were saying, you know, about I'm tall. And so people say, oh, you must do this. Oh, you must do that. I don't want to upset you, but it, it probably never goes away in life. Um, I, can, I can tell you as a teacher, when I was teaching in Virginia, um, black man, and, you know, people came and said, hey, coach. And, and I, I, I really didn't catch on for a while. You know, I grew up in Massachusetts in Springfield. I'm like, hey, coach. I'm like, I love sports. I've never coached a day in my life. And it was just all over the state. I go to conferences. Hey, coach. And so let me, just, I, I haven't told you what I taught yet, but I actually taught math. <laughs> and it was like, why do they keep calling me coach? And one of my colleagues said, because you're a big black man. I said, oh, so I could be coached. So that was just something I had, I learned at that time. Couldn't be a math teacher, right? Like you had to be coached. And then when I said, I, I teach, I don't coach. They would go, oh, you're a PE teacher. And I'm like, no, I teach math. And so even now, you know, you go certain places and the people that know me in the community, I've been here a long time now. You know, I'm in suits 99% of the time, probably six days a week. 
Um, I take my suit off and look like this, you know, casual when I go somewhere. Uh, trust me, they don't see a black man with a PhD who's been an educator, you know, a military veteran, lived overseas for years. They see none of that, none of that. You know, person who's, you know, been in many books and magazines and TV and people never, they don't see any of that. They see a black man and all the stereotypes come on. And so I do code switch. There are times when I turn on that PhD conversation, which usually is well above the person following me around the store, you know, but I do it on purpose. And then there are times that, you know, is, you know, and Sage, look at my face and, and Cassie, look at my face. So I'm a dark big brother, but my education has also caused me now to have another identity. So sometimes when I'm with family or friends, they'll say something completely, you know, not the proper vernacular or out of context. And they'll look at me and say, oh, I'm sorry, cuz, you know, Mr. PhD, you know, I know I didn't say the word right. So I get that too. And, you know, you just laugh it off and eat the ribs. But it's like, you're never going to stop code switching. It is, and unfortunately, like I said, it started, you know, in slavery for us here in this country. And it was, you know, it wasn't something that we wanted to do, but it was a survival technique. And now at this point we have it. But I love hearing people say, you know, across this discussion, that the key to everything is talking. You have to talk to each other, you know, and I like to say this before I close with this piece that all black folks aren't monolithic. And I think Nicole has stressed that, you know, she's a black girl grew up in the suburbs. Um, I didn't grow up in the suburbs. I dated a black girl who, who lived in the suburbs, you know, in the eighties, her life was, first of all, just driving up to her house. I was like, she says, you're okay. Like, you know, they know you're coming to visit me. I'm like, why? Because I'm the one black guy that drove to this town. Or this, you know, so, and it was true. The cops are like, oh, you must be going to see Amy. And I'm like, how did a cop know in a whole town where I'm going? But, you know, just a different life, very different life, you know? And so you just learn to adjust. But I also think it's, it's a skill and I would never want to get rid of it. You know, I travel the world a lot with world travelers. I love that I can flip, you know, with anyone in any country. And, you know, I don't have to talk like Dr. Hill. You know, I have all these identities and, and the confluence of all these identities really makes you that singular, unique person. So never forget your uniqueness. Sage, stay tall, girl. You No, I don't play basketball. <laughs> That's all, you know, but I will spike on you. You got to tell them that. Oh, thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Hill. It's just seeing how we still use code switching as a part of our survival mechanism is is so crucial, right? It, even though historically, that's what, like from history up to present day, it's evolved. That survival technique has evolved with us as we are evolving and all the way up through the pandemic. How do we even code switch online and how there's these different layers of ourselves based off of geography, based off of our age and race and so many different identities that make us who we are. So. Thank you so much for highlighting some of those. And I see Judge, you are unmuted. Would you like to share a bit as well? Sure. Um, I want to echo uh, Dr. Hill for those sentiments. As a professional Black man, I have even had the code switch. You know, people don't see, and I've spoken to Pastor Nicole Grant Youngman about this when we had a conversation on race last year. Her life, where, the way she came up was totally different from mine. But to look at me just like I'm dressed now, if I go in jeans or something, nobody care. They don't see the Judge Washington on me. All they see is, oh, here's a black man. And I have had to code switch every day, almost every day. I can talk to you as Judge Washington or I can talk to you as Kevin. And people constantly ask, you know, when they meet me, you know, I, they're giving me respect as Judge Washington, but then I'm asked, is it okay to call you Kevin? Do I know you? I earned that degree. I toiled for that degree. I did military service for this country, just like anyone else that wanted to be in the military. And I, I earned that respect. Why can't you give me the respect you'd give someone else that came from a European world? And it, it kind of hurts that we have to do that still. You know, it's almost insulting us as black men, I think, 
to not recognize my achievements. I don't need your pat on the back, but expect me for what I've accomplished. Respect me for what I've accomplished. And with that, um, there is a comment from Mrs. Andrews, Lynn Andrews. She's saying, um, being in her 60s, I know she noticed people's, people in stores. And she also said to continue, I feel sometimes they are assuming I am old and don't know what I want or what is going on. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to pose the question to the audience, you know, do people, you as a white people, do you have, do you ever feel that you have to code switch? Because this is a constant thing for us. Hmm. All right, I see a couple of hands. Uh, Ooh, go ahead, Deborah. would you like to go first? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure if this actually speaks to that exact question, but no, as a white person, I don't feel like I ever have to code switch. But one of the really important lessons I have learned, and hopefully I will continue with it as a white person, is to know when to just stop talking. That um, listening, Listening is very often far more important because I'm gonna learn something. And that um, if there's ever a thought in the back of my head and before I say it, I wonder to myself, is this appropriate or is this offensive or is this just a really stupid thing to say? Chances are the, the answer is yes. And I just shut up. So I don't, I don't know if that falls into the category of code speaking or code silencing. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I see quite a few hands up. We'll go to Agnes, Lisa, then Lynn. All right, Agnes, go ahead. The interesting listening to, I, okay, I learned a new thing today, code switching, which is what I think having grown up and having come of age and gone into the corporate world during the feminist movement, we did it as women all the time. And, and when you think about going into the boardroom and being respected for the education that you fought for and then being demeaned, isn't it your turn to get the coffee today? Always, it's your turn to get the coffee today. Um, on a gender side, Yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. And what came to mind as Judge Washington, you were speaking, was the way they demeaned our first lady and demeaned her PhD because she was a woman. Um, so yes, it, it rings so true um, in my life as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing how we sometimes code switch in different ways based off of which identities either brought to us more at the forefront of our mind or through different experiences in our life. So thank you so much. Lisa? I'm just going to say one thing I, I have in common or feel in common is the pain that's involved when you have to code switch because it is painful. But I had two quick examples. One, when I moved to Connecticut from New York City. And boy, did I have a New York accent. I could tell you right now, that's the way I was brought up. You know, I was brought up in New York and, uh, you know, from the lower, lower middle class, maybe poor. But long story short, when I got to Connecticut, oh, my goodness. I had to Red really... <laughs> I had to use my, I was trained in the theater, thank goodness, because when I came to Connecticut, every time I went to an interview, I was mortally embarrassed because I quickly realized that when I opened my mouth, the face of the people, the face of the people across from me was, boy, what a dumb, what a dumb broad, because I had a New York accent and it gave an impression. So I quickly realized as a theater major, I need to use my theater, theater voice. So that's what I did. And the second thing I have my, my favorite fellow counselor and I often talk about on the council when we're speaking how people are very, very kind to tell us that we are often too nice. 
And I think that's because as what Agnes said, that if I really, um, if I really emoted uh, the way I wanted to in a council meeting, uh, I would definitely be, uh, I feel I need to code switch all the time because I would be definitely labeled as the angry white old lady um, you know, who is, and I don't mean that in a racial way, I mean in an old way, that I, I, I'm angry and um, inappropriate. And so I constantly uh, have to feel like I have to use the ultra, ultra polite and not exhibit any of my anger because I will be in, misinterpreted as just an angry old lady. So I, it's, again, I don't feel it's on the level of, of the deep hurt that I, I, other people feel, but I do identify with that hurt on, on a different level. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Cause I think that w that point you were talking about how, you know, when you code switch, there's still that pain involved, how we're all connected through some of these pains of just like, this is difficult. But then as Dr. Hill said, like, it's a part of like, it's become a part of who we are, that perception, that identity that's constantly changing and growing with us. So just Yes, y'all are y'all are great here in the community. Just bringing up so many different um, aspects here, Lynn. Yeah, um, I absolutely identify um, with what Lisa had just said, and also for me, um, not being afraid to ask, like, you know, ask one of my kids or or I, even even another person my age. I got an email today, and at the bottom, before the person signed their name, they put I M H O. And I was like, what? Is that a typo or what is that? So I just said, what is I-M-H-O? And it was in my humble opinion, you know, like, like yes, everybody knew that and I didn't, but she didn't say, you're really dumb to ask that question. She just told me what it was, you know? So it's like not being, not being angry and not being afraid to ask because I, I think it helps to learn and it also helps someone else if they can teach me, so. Thanks, and thanks for doing this. This is great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. I think that that point of meeting people with where they're at, not having that like assumption or that perception of like, oh, am I going to think about like what comes to my mind when I look at you? Or how can I maybe just have that open mind and, and, and maybe have this, this opportunity to say, oh, I'm going to meet you for who you are and where you are in this moment right? Because who I am now is very different than who I was when I went to Windsor High, like physically, mentally, emotionally, and like, and even with my identity, I'm, I'm just so different than who I used to be. So maybe if I can have that new mindset or that understanding of, oh, wait, I'm going to meet you for who you are and who we are in this moment, that can open new doors and opportunities. And this really leads us into our final question that I'm gonna pose to our, our panelists and then I'm gonna open it up to you all as well. So um, our final question for tonight is, what is one thing you wish people knew about you before assuming about your age or race? I'm gonna say that one more time because we're really talking about those perceptions and deconstructing it. So I'm gonna say the question one more time and I'll put it in the chat. What is one thing you wish people knew about you before assuming about your age or race? And to provide an example here, I wish that people knew that I, I just love teaching, I love figure skating, and that sometimes when you have these perceptions of me, they're not always right. Everyone's always like, oh, well, well, you, you must be so proud that after coming abroad from these countries or, or oh, you represent your people so well. And it's like, oh, well, before you, you, you go place on that on me, I wish you knew that I, I just, I'm passionate about figure skating, that I love to teach, that I love to learn, that I love to coach. That's, that's how Sage and I met, right? So what's one of your things? And I'll turn it over to whoever's ready, Mac and Lisa or Sage and Nicole. Um, I personally feel that I don't really have, like, especially with my race, I don't have, um, certain stereotypes assigned to me that I have to correct. Um, and, um, yeah, I feel like if anything, I could talk more about age and, um, even with that, it's more of just, um, 
like even my dad the other day, he said that my generation is lazy and um, we don't want to work. We don't want to do anything. We want the money to come to us ourselves and we don't, we're just lazy. Um, or anytime I go to my grandparents' house, immediately when we walk in, they're like, we should get a phone basket because you're always on your phones. And it's just like this thing where it's like, we're seen as just kind of dumb and dependent on technology. And um, when in reality, it's, yeah, I'm on my phone, but I'm texting my mom. Or yeah, I'm on my phone, but I'm talking to a friend or I'm reading the news. Or, But instead it's automatically just, the worst possible scenario. And um, so I'd say if anything, it's just the assumption of kind of with age, the just stupidity. And um, I would consider myself smart and many people in my generation are too. And I don't think that we should be belittled because of our age. Hmm. I would add into that, um what really hit me was when Agnes was sharing about the whole kind of the gender piece and, and being a female in male dominated spaces and just kind of being looked at as, you know, well, we'll ask you what you think maybe later or how you can finally get your voice heard in a space. Um, so I think that what I'd like people to know is as, as strong as I am about the way that I want to help and see certain things. I'm also a learner. So I'm also very open to hearing things. Um, and that I'm really, really hurt and angry about what's going on in the world right now. And I don't want to, I don't want to just kind of keep moving. I want to be part of making a difference and learning ways um, to contribute in that way. It, it's on me. Like I'm the one I'm accountable for making it happen. No one's going to give me the, the playbook. Um, so I want people to know that that's, and I have to put that out there. Otherwise I'm going to not be part of those communities that want to make a difference. And that's one of the things I loved about this program tonight and last year when they were really launching this, you know, the, the community conversations. And even though one of the first ones I attended was a listening one, it was one of the most valuable gifts I had to know that we have people within our community that are experiencing things that they shouldn't and how to, how to be a part of changing that. So that's the piece I'd want people to know. Absolutely, thank you so much for sharing, Mac and Lisa. All right, Sage and Nicole. Yes, thank you guys for sharing. Um, I have a lot to say on this topic. So I feel, um, I'm gonna look at that question again, it's like, what is one thing <laughs> you wish people knew about? Okay, so I'm in the same boat as I feel as though that um, it's like people assume that, especially with the race aspect, people assume that I'm dumb. I don't really know that much. And I'm actually an A student, you know, but I'm going to be honest. I kind of like people not knowing that because I stay humble, you know, and then when the day comes, I'll be walking across that stage. I'll be getting my diploma, right? And you're just like, oh, wow, I should have been doing that stuff. So I think it's great in that way, but I hate the assumption of, Oh, she's probably getting F's. Oh, all this different stuff. And then I also wanted to talk about the way, um, like, um, black um, black girls are like um, perceived. If that's the right word, yes. So, for instance, um, like getting their nails done, fake nails, long nails, um, getting like their bundles done. I mean, that's great. You look gorgeous, girl. But I'm not that. Um, person like I'm not going to be sitting on the weekend getting my nails done no I'm going to be sitting at home probably watching Netflix you know <laughs> I'm not going to be reading the book but it's just um it's just don't assume that I'm a certain way I'm actually vastly different from everyone and I just feel as though even though the girls that do fall do that don't assume that everyone's going to fall in that same category so yeah that's that's really yeah I got the Atlantic question, and I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with my, what is it, master? I think I'm going to get a cup of coffee, but, um, oh, I get another lantern. Um, one thing people knew about me before seeing about my age or race, correct? Yep. Um, <clears throat> hmm. I would say... 
Um, I'm accomplished, but I care. And those are two very weird things that came out of my mouth. But what I mean by that is a lot of people, and depending in different situations, I'm finding out I think I'm the most kind of happy-go-lucky, crazy, empathetic uh, person that you ever meet. I really, truly, truly care. Um, but people see me, they're very intimidated. And I'm glad that I'm wearing my sweat shirt and all that. I think people think, you know, four and a half inch stilettos and I'm wearing a suit. So I can become very um, intimidated. This is what I hear back from other people. And um, I'm nothing like that. So I think I would want one people before they even look at my shelf to know that I care and I, I make sure for other people and not myself, if that makes any sense to anybody. Um, that in my brain because I'm tired, but nonetheless, um, <laughs> that's what I wanted to share. I matter, I have a voice and um, I care. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you so much for our panelists sharing today. And now it's everyone else's turn here. If I can get a couple of volunteers, you can type it in the chat. Or if you'd like to unmute yourself by raising your hand and I'll call on you. Um, what is one thing you wish people knew about you before assuming your age and race? If I can get two volunteers. I will call on you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here I go. Five, four, three, two, one. My first pick is uh, Pastor Nicole Grant Youngman, and my second is uh, Mr. Doug Shipman. Now, tagged. <laughs> so I, I don't know if Pastor Nicole is, is actually there. Um, so I'll buy her some time while she's getting back to her computer. How's that? So, you know, this is a hard question. Uh, and I, very interesting. The, the answers that I come up with, I will confess, feel very much like coming from a place of privilege. And so I'm kind of embarrassed to even uh, share them in, in this forum. But I don't know. Uh, so one thing often, I guess I look a little younger than I am sometimes. And, you know, maybe a little bit like Judge Washington, who, uh, hey, I earned this title. Uh, you know, I'm a retired Army colonel. I'm 61 years old. But people will, and I anyway, know we have many veterans on the, on the call today, which is awesome. Um, but often people don't, they, they, they treat you like a younger person sometimes because you might look, you know, I, I pass as younger, I guess, to use the vernacular. So maybe that's uh, a little bit of something, but um, uh, I, I don't, I think as I walk through life, I don't feel like I have to explain a lot to people. And that's, that's an amazing privilege to be able to have, I think. And I, I recognize that as I try to formulate what I would say uh, in response to this. So that's a good question. Off to you, Pastor Nicole, if you're, <laughs> if you're there. I'm going to mute myself again. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. I think she may not be there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to choose my next backup. Um, I know about a little about this family, so I would like them to talk about their past experiences and what they do. And that would be Kate and Hugh McLean. Yep, oh, he's gotta unmute yourself there. There you go. Yeah, have to, <laughs> that's nice. Like we're not seeing us, ourselves on the screen. That's sort of nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, our past experience. Yeah, I, I agree. Look up, look up. Yeah, we, we struggle with the issue of white privilege. Uh, both of us, I'll start. Um, 
I grew up in a, in a small New England town south of Boston that really was a what they call a bedroom community. Uh, we were all, most of us were in the town where Republic was a very Republican town. Uh, the men all went off to work into Boston during the day and the mothers stayed home. I mean, I'm 82 years old, so I'm one of these silent people. I'm a traditionalist. And uh, it was through our experiences at once I left the town I grew up in and went to a Quaker boarding school that I began to really appreciate the importance of respect for diversity and understanding how important it was to live, be able to live in a society or in a community that was racially diverse and, and economically diverse. And the diversity is really what makes us who we are in the United States. Uh, we're not all one people. We really are lots of different people from different backgrounds. And we certainly have heard that today. Um, we, spent, we spent two years in, living in Nigeria in the Peace Corps and learned a lot about being a minority because we definitely were the white minority living in Nigeria. Hugh taught at the University of Abaddon. Um, came back here and uh, have been in Windsor since 1970. So, but we still are very, very privileged. We live in a, in a congregate living situation, Seabury in Bloomfield. And we live among people of our own age group. Um, it's very hard to find a lot of diversity here, except that all the people that take care of us and that have been taking care of us and keeping us safe happen to be either brown or black people. And that, that really creates a problem for us living here. How, how can we really expand our community when they are the helpers and we are the ones that are helped? Um, we are still privileged. And uh, so I guess that's all I want to say. I want to see if Hugh wants to say anything. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be brief. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I never learned the word, what the word privilege was, let alone white privilege, until about two years ago when I first heard the expression, why don't you check your privilege at the door and come on in. Um, what I guess I, I would like people, would not like people to know about, but what I wish I could talk about more was suicide. <clears throat> I have a brother that um, committed suicide. It was unsuccessful, but uh, he was damaged enough so that uh, the after effects of that uh, really limited his life in such a way that he died uh, from natural causes two years later. Um, and that experience comes out of his, uh, his gayness, his uh, homosexuality, as we tried to talk about it back in the day. <clears throat> Uh, I was the black sheep in the family. I was the only one of my brothers who was not gay. <clears throat> um, and that put me in an in a interesting situation that I've been grappling with ever since. But it certainly did uh, make me aware that there were uh, different, <laughs> different strokes for different folks. Um, I'm, a, I'm a religious person, and I'm not ashamed to say that, even though I'm a professional white Anglo-Saxon Protestant among whose um, colleagues are totally embarrassed for me to, to admit that I would be religious and still a scholar of sorts. Um, so, uh, I guess I'd like people to know I'm religious. Uh, I, we won't okay. go into specifically what that means, but uh, okay. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, because we all experience each part of our identities in so many different ways. And it's beautiful to just see us all come come together with all of our diversity and diverse thoughts, diverse backgrounds and experiences and be able to 
find a common ground and understand one another better through these experiences, through our differences and similarities. So I thank each and every one of you here. Before we fully close out, if you would all like to type in the chat, you can find it either at the bottom of your screen. It's like a little bubble um, with, a, with like the letter V at the bottom. Um, or if you're coming from an iPad or cell phone, you click the three dots. And then when you click on them, you'll see the chat pop up. And you're going to type one word here. You're going to share one key takeaway on how you're feeling after um, this event today. And I will type it in as well before I turn it over to Judge Washington for some announcements. All right, I'll type it here. Excellent, I see community. And thank you so much for sharing in the chat as well, Lisa. Encouraged, appreciative, eager, listening, She's good enough. Hopeful, thankful, more connected to everyone. Comfort. I added the word love. And I see from some more friends here, I am encouraged by this level of vulnerability and appreciative that people are leaning into this topic. Many takeaways. Learning, well done. Hopeful. Enlightened. Excellent. So I encourage you all to take all of these different feelings here. And before I know, Judge, before you go into your spiel on our announcements here, mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to close out by sharing a couple of um, things here. So we have done our closing thoughts here. And before I send that over, I just want to show you that action comes in many forms. We might have all these different feelings, but you can give your feelings legs, meaning what are you going to do with it? Are you gonna go on to social media and be like, oh my gosh, I just went to the best event ever as some of my friends do <laughs> as millennials? Or well, maybe I continue to educate myself by attending protests, rallies. There are virtual rallies now online. There are different ways we can show this with random acts of kindness, starting an action club or a, your own group via Zoom, going to online volunteering, having conversation with folks and challenging yourself every day when, when you are able to being like, how, how can I, how can I give my, my emotions and feelings legs to do more and against some of these forms of oppression here, right? So this is where we were nearly a year ago, right? On the town of Windsor Green. I know I was there. Judge, thank you for taking this picture. I just pop it right here so we all can see not only from your perspective, but to really look out and reflect. So I encourage you all to continue to reflect on each of, of these um, conversations and moments here. All right, I'll stop my screen share here. So Judge, you have some announcements about some, some ways we can continue conversing and connecting with each other. Yes, first I'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for attending this conversation. It means the world to me to see you see you participate in this forum um, and being a part of the conversation. A special thanks to my facilitator, Cassie Copeland, to uh, the ladies that joined us, Sage and Nicole, um, and Mackenzie and Lisa. Um, we have another conversation coming up next Sunday, same time frame, six to eight. Um, it will uh, 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 speak to uh, our special guest will be uh, the youngest guy in the room, Mr. Douglas Shipman, who is the executive director of the Windsor Historical Society. And I own our own town counselor, uh, Nujet Black Burke. Um, we will talk about um, the first town becoming, uh, passing the resolution acknowledging race as a public health crisis. And we will also talk about the exhibit panel um, that the Windsor Historical Society is doing. We will also, just as a, a word of note, uh, we will be doing the 2020 Bridge Builders Awards. The applications will go up, uh, open March 1st. And we will accept those until the 31st of March. Are there 31 days in March? I don't know what that rhyme is, uh, 31 days, whatever. Um, the end of the month. <laughs> so, um, and then we will be doing the awards in April for 2020. We will also be, the Human Relations Commission will be celebrating uh, Women's History Month. 
which is March 1st through the 30th, 31st as well. There will be events surrounding that um, that are being put together to honor the women of Windsor and what you have brought to this community and what you continue to give us day to day. Um, there will also be, um, we will talk about on March 21st and you will get an email notice of all of this so you don't have to write it down. On the 28th of March, we will have one of our bridge builders, uh, Maria Rodriguez Furlo. We will discuss our One Book, One Windsor book that we chose last year uh, by uh, Ibrahim uh, Hinde, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and also Stamped, which is a very good book as well. We will discuss both of those books, or she will. And finally, we will be doing movies we will ask you to watch a movie, Netflix, YouTube, um, Amazon Prime. Um, we will ask you to watch a movie and then come prepare to discuss that movie. So again, I thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ladies, my special panelists. Thank you, Cassie. I will allow you to say good night and I appreciate you all so very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. I put my contact information there if you want to keep going, but I know it is a little past eight. So thank you so much and have a great night. Bye-bye.